thank you, Your Honor, for a chance to uh, basically provide uh, the court with facts that I think uh, really bear upon the question of whether I'm ever going to be doing that particular thing again. And, um, you know, I want to say to begin with, I'm too old. I need a desk job. <laughs> okay, I really do. But the, at the end of the last, um, at the end of the last uh, hearing, I realized something had been left unsaid. Remember, I asked you uh, if law enforcement would be as upset about me moving medical marijuana from out west where it's legal to back east where it's legal to Michigan where there are 20,000 registered patients uh, at me taking a junkie from Wisconsin where Ibogaine is illegal, moving across to Michigan where uh, it's illegal to Ontario where we're setting up a clinic and it's legal. <coughs> of course, the diff thing I didn't left unsaid was that um, You only have to take Ibogaine once. Ibogaine is the first thing that we can give a heroin addict where when the Ibogaine effect wears off, the physical withdrawal, the mental craving are completely eliminated. It's also the only thing that works for crystal meth and the only thing that works for crack cocaine or methcathinone. And it works for alcohol really well. With marijuana, of course, people are going to have to medicate for the rest of their lives for many of these conditions. It's just not practical to send people to Michigan every afternoon to medicate from Madison. Can't be done. But uh, I was not, and I've said this before, delivering any of this marijuana to the state of Wisconsin. It was going to three places. It was going to New York City, where we have tolerance. It was going to Washington, D.C. I work with Mr. Pilka. And it was going to Michigan, which is where I'm from. Back when I uh, first entered ACT UP, uh, it was to uh, get act up to back Ibogaine uh, as a cure for addiction because half of all AIDS cases are involved with addiction. And for four years, even though I was importuned, I did not start to do medical marijuana. I was also on probation at the time, and uh, I was wary because I was actually arrested in 1987 because I was set up by another left-wing faction. So I was suspicious. Then finally, uh, I was going up to Boston to get the act up there to support uh, Ibogaine. There was a big controversy there, people trying to shut down the needle exchange. And uh, they had no marijuana. People could get marijuana in New York. So I broke my own rule. I got arrested. And thanks to William Kunstler, who's a really great lawyer. Instead of getting a year and a half, uh, I got 40 days. And when I got done, um, there was no reason anymore not to do medical marijuana, because everybody knew, and people were asking. So we started, first it was a free distribution, but people actually wanted to buy it, because they wanted to get better stuff, and they wanted to get more. And within about, two years, we had 300 patients. And we had we instituted an a ID card, uh, like the deal exchange. And by and large, because New York is a, a decrim state, up to 27 grams or only a $100 fine, with the card, a patient could either get the policeman not to write the ticket, 
or get the judge to tear up the ticket. I also at that time worked with uh, Dennis Perone in California between 1992 and 1996 when he wrote the bill and I tried to get Dennis to come here to testify because I think he's very important. He wrote the law and I got medical marijuana for him in San Francisco. But he has had a stroke and was not able to make it. So beginning in 1996, uh, we had a, a system where people would meet in a house, but never in the same house, would be hosted. Dennis, who's uh, testified here, uh, he's now relocated to Wisconsin, uh, was one of those hosts. And by dint of having it move around, it never bothered the neighbors that much, didn't have the problems associated with theft that you might have at a dispensary. We had a very stable system, but one day, Johan Moore, who was the fellow who actually had taken over distri distribu distributing the pot to the patients, couldn't get into the sculpture garden on East 2nd Street. So he started to do it in the street, sure enough, he got arrested. And he uh, went to court, and because there was something called the Oliveri Statute, which was passed uh, to immunize uh, people with you know, a genuine need for medical marijuana. Uh, District Attorney Robert Morgenthau uh, conceded that it is not the usual practice of their office to prosecute um, distribution under appropriate circumstances to bona fide patients. And what this meant was they set aside the other part of the Oliveri statute, which was you're supposed to get it from the federal government. And they, they basically said, you know, if, if people can't amalgamate to send somebody out to get it, the, the ability to have it is a dead letter. If you can't get it, you'll never have it. Well, uh, in 2000, there was another case. Uh, somebody actually was running something like a dispensary where they met the same place all the time. I told them it was a bad idea, but uh, the police came in and uh, were very, very upset to find that everybody in the room was the person with AIDS, because they had a directive. I mean, there was big meetings at the uh, Gay and Lesbian Center uh, with members of the NYPD in attendance, medical marijuana meetings. It was, you know, well on the way to being tolerated. In 2001, uh, the same person was stopped uh, in his car uh, taking it from point A to point B, and they said, well, you can't move it around, you can't get it. And then in 2004, uh, we had the case of the medical marijuana granny who had to go down to the schoolyard in uh, the Bronx. And, uh, you know, it took me about three times to get through a lawyer to tell her, hey, you know, you don't have to go down to the schoolyard. We're set up to take care of that. So it was expanded to all, um, four, five, all five boroughs of Manhattan. And uh, in effect, we have one law downstate and an another law upstate because uh, there's gridlock in Albany and they just haven't been able to get that medical marijuana law passed. Uh, in 2007, I believe, they finally counted the votes in DC and I started to work with John Pilka. And then in 2008, they passed a law in Michigan and right away, Thousands of people signed up. I think there's 20,000 registered patients in Michigan. And as I said, you know, if you took the amount of, most of the stuff I, I had was bound for Michigan. Uh, apparently, Greg Francisco, who was a head of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Association, was verify what I was saying, got lost getting here because he's unfamiliar with Wisconsin, but he was definitely on his way. Anyway, I'm from Michigan. I was born in Michigan. I have a number of siblings in Michigan, so I can testify about Michigan. And we wanted to bring our model of the buyer's club, which is actually, they already had buyers, not buyer's club, yeah, buyer's clubs, instead of the dispensary uh, to Michigan. And uh, the only other thing I can say is that, you know, in the 90s it was AIDS. In the aughts, I guess you call them, the issue became more cancer. And we found out that it had a lot of uh, utility for cancer. So, you know, that has something to do with the fact why Lance Raymer was smoking uh, in that car when he was confined here. 
uh, his cancer exploded, and uh, he, uh, he was actually bent over in excruciating pain. Uh, they first didn't take it very seriously, and then they found out he had to have an operation, and they needed another operation that they couldn't do, so they had to let him go. But as I said before, if you think that you know, he couldn't smell it, I mean, o Officer Zempel said he, he smelled it. You think that Lance Raymer couldn't smell it, then you know, I have a bridge in Brooklyn I can sell you. So I want to, uh, in a way, go back to the beginning because um, this bears upon the two questions. One, will I reoffend? Two, um, it bears on the one issue, the one case where I'm charged with an act of violence. I think you have to understand that case to understand what makes me tick and to choose what kind of sentence to give me. In 1973, uh, Ed Rosenthal, who's in the courtroom, introduced me to a gentleman named Howard Lotsoff, who uh, was interested in studying mind-expanding substances, which I was also interested in. I wasn't just interested in marijuana because, as you know, LSD had been tried out for treatment of alcoholism, and had some success, and my father was an alcoholic. So after about nine months, I'm sitting with, Ed Rose, uh, with Howard Lotsoff right after Richard Nixon resigns. And uh, he tells me that he took a drug, a really obscure drug from Africa, called Ibogaine. Uh, and it got rid of his heroin addiction overnight. And he gave it to seven more people, uh, including people who did heroin and people who did cocaine and people who did heroin and cocaine, and five of them quit drugs cold for six months or longer. And this is very interesting to me because I had done a protest at McGovern's headquarters in 1972 at the Democratic Convention in Miami and uh, asked uh, McGovern, um, in light of the reports that the CIA, certain contractors were pipelining major amounts of heroin into the inner cities. How we were going to protect millions of kids who already did marijuana or were in the black market from being exposed to heroin unless we were to make marijuana sold over the counter and regulate it to separate it from hard drugs. And McGovern was the one who said he made that speech uh, on a floor of the Senate about the CIA, which was a nice concession, but he never did answer the question. Uh, so I was really, you know, you know, it's like the, in the cartoon where the light goes off next to your head. I was really, really struck by this. The other thing uh, that Howard Lotsoff told me was that he was the first person busted under the LSD law. And it was a typical conspiracy case where there was no LSD and there was no money, and it was only the word of an informant trying to save himself. And at a certain point of the trial, kind of the high point of the trial, the prosecutor mocked Howard Lotsoff and said to him, you say you're a legitimate researcher. Tell me one thing you ever discovered. And Howard Lotsoff said, I discovered that I began gets rid of heroin and cocaine addiction. And the judge slammed down his gavel cleared the courtroom, and 10 minutes later brought in the jury back in and instructed them that they were to disregard that last comment. And I've often wondered what would have happened if they'd been a little bit more interested in ascertaining the truth rather than getting a, securing a quick conviction. If there'd been a New York Times reporter, a sympathetic reporter in the room, and the word had got out about Ibogaine then, well, then, you know, it wouldn't have been made illegal the next year. Because what happened was these narcotics policemen, uh, in order to dot their I's and cross their T's, went to the Federal Register and put in a thing to make Ibogaine scheduled. And in the uh, paperwork on that, which has actually been located by Douglas Green, who testified here, uh, they uh, mentioned HSL. So actually, Ibogaine was not like made illegal because of any innate property of Ibogaine, but just because they kind of really demonized the person who discovered it. It was kind of guilt by association. There was nothing about the properties of Ibogaine. 
if it hadn't been made illegal and the word had gotten out, then all the people who were addicted to heroin in the early 70s, and then again in the late 70s when it really came back, all the people who got hepatitis C from addiction, all the people who, you know, were part of the crack epidemic, all the people who got AIDS, they didn't have to die. And the one thing I kick myself in the, uh, you know, posterior about is that I didn't do anything about it right away. Because I was standing next to Jimmy Carter's uh, drug czar, uh, Peter Bourne, and I didn't know, he was much more interested in treating heroin than he was in legalizing pot, but it was a normal party. And we were supposed to like only talk about legalizing pot. And it wasn't until the founder of High Times, Tom Fursad, passed away that um, you know, things began to heat up. And there are these people who wanted to put a heroin chic cover on High Times magazine, which at the time was mostly about pot, but there was some cocaine in it. And the people in, these were the people from the art department. And they had a big heroin problem themselves. And they wanted more people to buy heroin from them so they could support their habit. But the people from the editorial department were all people from the underground press who were left wingers. And they were really against that. So There's a lot of very bitter feeling and people accusing other people of being Puritans. But we stopped that from happening. And then they tried to do the same thing at the Village Voice because it was the same art department people for the Village Voice, um, the Soho Weekly News, and High Times. And the Village Voice instead ran a negative article about it. And then in the early 1980, it was about May, this big newspaper special in the Soho Weekly News cover heroin chic. And this huge article on the inside, this angelic woman uh, with a mirror what looked like lines of cocaine, which is very acceptable at the time. Uh, and the message was, it's not necessarily good, but everybody's doing it. And of course, people don't do drugs because they're good. They do them because everybody else is doing them. And they even had a, a poster that went up on every newsstand with no accompanying text. They just said heroin chic, just like advertising heroin. So uh, we had a demonstration in front of the Soho Weekly News and even had a real junkie do, uh, you know, tie herself up and do a mock overdose death. And they would not print our uh, letter because they said that people who advocated the separation of marijuana and hard drugs had an agenda and that the only people who were sophisticated enough to understand heroin were people who used it. Well, that summer, um, there was a lot of heroin. We were bringing in kids for the protest at the Democratic Convention in New York City at the same time. All the kids from the Grateful Dead uh, were coming through following Jerry. And Jerry was a junkie. A lot of people don't know that. And all those kids became junkies. And then all the other kids became junkies. And we didn't start the movement to separate marijuana from hard drugs to turn everybody on to heroin. So uh, one day I went over there, demanded to talk to Paul Slansky, who was the editor in charge of that story, and he would not see me. And I uh, set off a firecracker as a protest. And it was a loud firecracker. It was a big firecracker. And uh, unbeknownst to me, somebody was hit by a teeny tiny piece of flying paper. And I never intended it to be anything but a symbolic protest to, to, to lay down a marker. And I was horrified that anybody had been hurt. And they still knew it would not print our stuff. In fact, now they said we were a dangerous marijuana cult. So we had a demonstration with uh, 600 people marching over from the Washington Square Park to the Soho Weekly News. And it kind of reached a point where we didn't know what to do next. And it's December 12th, 1980. And Howard Lotsoff says, you know what we should do? Uh, this us against them stuff isn't working. The police control all the violence. That isn't working. Let's try to make a cure for addiction available. And so I gave him $1,500, and he started the Ibogaine Project, the Staten Island Project, which was like to be like the Manhattan Project. It would be 
to find something that would wipe out addiction and leave the addict standing. So you have to ask yourself, what does it take to justify a protest? Because we knew about overdose deaths, and we knew about hepatitis C, right? So people were dying. This is lethal stuff. This isn't like something you could dispute, like, is medical marijuana really medical? This was, you know, I, I, I kind of compared giving heroin to people who are used to passing around a joint or are going to pass around a needle to giving the Indians blankets inf in infected with smallpox. And you can't really tell what's in somebody's bloodstream. What I didn't know is that that junkie who tied, you know, did the mock overdose death had something we didn't know about yet, wouldn't know about for two years, called AIDS. And all those people sharing needles were getting AIDS, and nobody knew. And later, somebody from the National AIDS Brigade told me I was right in the book, that that was a charnel house, Bruce Brown's place, where they were passing the needles, and 500 people caught the virus and died. So what we had to do was we had to pay for Howard Lotsoff to live for 10 years. And everything that we did gradually was subsumed. The newspaper where we published the uh, story that we discovered a cure for heroin addiction, that went out of existence. Everything was consumed because it takes, if you don't do it in a guerrilla fashion, it takes $100 million to uh, develop a new drug these days. And we were doing it cheap. Howard Lotsoff first did a patent for interruption of heroin dependency, then a interruption of cocaine dependency, then interruption of nicotine dependency, then interruption of methamphetamine dependency and alcohol dependency. And then in 1987, he went over to Gabon and got root bark and gave it to the Center for National Scientific Research in uh, Paris, and they actually made ibogaine, and they started giving it to animals, and finally, um, they gave it to 10 junkies in Holland, and lo and behold, it worked just like Howard Lotsoff said it did. And every group that came after that still had to, like, reinvent the wheel and prove to themselves all over again that it worked, because the next group we went to was the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And we got them to spend $5 million investigating it, mostly animal work, but it supported a uh, clinical trial for cocaine dependency, which there was nothing for crack cocaine. And then they abandoned it because they needed all their money for Suboxone, which is like a methadone that doesn't get you high. And they passed it off to Deborah Mash and the University of Miami. And Deborah Mash was married to Joe Geller, who was the head of the Dade County Democratic Party. And um, Instead of really dealing straight with Howard Lotsoff, they tried to steal his patent. So that, you know, they got involved in a long dispute, but she set up a clinic in St. Kitts, which was the first government licensed clinic in the world, and they treated between four and 600 people, and they proved it worked, and they proved that it could be given safely. Myself, I did the book called The Report in the Staten Island Project, and with Paul DiRienzo uh, on WBAI, uh, we used to sell the book uh, as uh, basically they would hand out a prize if you signed up to support the station, you know, $500 membership, or no, uh, well, they could have 500 but $100 membership, you got a, our book, which would cost the station $10, so that we made some money and they made $90. And one morning, Paul DiRienzo calls me up, and it's like 7 in the morning, and he says, uh, Santiago uh, can't make it today because he's sick. Santiago is his co-host, and he had AIDS. Uh, would you like to come down and co-host the show? So I came down and co-hosted the show. And about, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes to 9, the, the engineer started jumping up and down, pointing to the TV station, and the plane had crashed into the World Trade Center because it was sem September 11th. 2001, and a few minutes later, this other jet slammed into the other world, other tower, and then we knew that this is not an accident. This is a conspiracy. And I said, this has something to do with this story I read about the 
them assassinating the head of the Northern Alliance. It's not, you know, it, this only makes sense if you're sitting in, in the shoes of Osama bin Laden. And since Paul had done this exhaustive work as a reporter on uh, the earlier bombing of the World Trade Center, um, you know, we went, it was off to the races. We were the first people. It was like four, three hours before the White House came out with an official statement. We had the truth. And the, basically, I saw this blue sky, because we were six blocks downwind from the World Trade Center. I saw this blue sky turn to total darkness. Well, you know what happened next. The United States uh, kicked out the Taliban, which had actually been pretty good about keeping people from using heroin, because you can do that if you cut their head off. Uh, but uh, we basically went into business with the heroin lords in uh, Afghanistan, and you know they developed a. Tr yeah, I'm almost done. They, they, you know, developed a tremendous heroin problem there, and the rest of the world developed a tremendous heroin problem. Well, um, my co my counsel is telling me to hurry up, so I will. There's only a couple more things that I need to tell you. One. In 2005, we figured out how this stuff worked, which is somebody discovered that Ibogaine expresses a growth factor that causes the brain cells, the dopamine cells, that are uh, stunted by drugs of abuse to grow back. And not only that, it tells the nucleus, the cell, to make more growth factor so that you don't have to give more Ibogaine. You only have to give it once. It's kind of like... Uh, it's just like the sorcerer's apprentice. Uh, more growth factor makes more growth factor. The other thing was, a little bit after that, Dr. Ken Alper uh, did this paper on 3,414 treatments in which he found that 56% of all treatments were for heroin. Well, this is very interesting because there's no placebo for heroin withdrawal. You can't fool a junkie with milk sugar. In fact, if you go out and try to sell milk sugar, the same place twice, you'll be, you know, get beaten up. So uh, what it means is that to you or I, where Ibogaine would be, you know, this fairly unpleasant experience, to these other people, this is tremendous relief and then healing. So I, I, I'd done all these conferences and, and uh, did the uh, harm reduction conference, the North American Harm Reduction Conference uh, for three uh, uh, panels in a row and did a yearly conference in New York, flew people in. And uh, I went to the International Harm Reduction Conference in Barcelona, and they would not let me present this information because there was a gentleman there named Alex Wodak who really, really believed in maintenance drugs. In fact, he'd sponsored, spent all their money sponsoring comparative trials of heroin maintenance and methadone. And he really was not ready for what we were trying to say. So I went back, and we, about this time we got this idea from the DEA that uh, we should have somebody from Congress send a letter to the DEA asking how a drug that has no abuse potential can be scheduled. Because you have to have a high potential for abuse to be in one of the schedules, and Ibogaine has none. And I spent about a year and uh, tried a couple of congressmen, didn't get anywhere. Uh, then I went over to New Zealand. You heard what happened in New Zealand. They have a tremendous crystal meth problem. And they got it legalized because of my, the same information I couldn't present in Barcelona. I got it legalized in New Zealand in three months, which was in Alex Wodek's backyard. So I came back, and in early 2010, um, a couple things happened. Howard Lotsa died, which made me kind of his successor. And uh, they introduced a crystal meth bill in Congress, which attracted my attention to two people in Congress that I hadn't tried the letter on yet, which is Tammy Baldwin from Madison and Jan Schakowsky from Illinois, because they were both on the health committee that would have to consider this bill. And it was a bill to pay for, it was a bill to pay for uh, uh, clinical research into a cure for crystal meth. Well, then the Republicans won in November. See, I'm getting up to the current year. Republicans won in November, so I went back to the letter. And uh, I'd been in a lot of communication with Ben Mazel in Madison. 
And he was a kind of unique person in the whole country because he got one seventh of the vote against Herb Cole. And he also really understood Ibogaine. So he was supposed to set up a thing where Tammy Baldwin would circulate this letter. Except that on the way to the meeting, I was stopped in Barneville. Well, we, you know, uh, did rewrite the letter and put in some stuff about why it has no abuse potential. Animals don't inject it. it it's like Thorazine. Nobody, you know, diverts their Thorazine into the black market because it has unpleasant side effects, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, two things happened. One, Ben died in April. So probably Ben isn't going to be able to do that anymore. And the other thing that really was really great is Alex Wode got fired. And this is very important because the resistance to Ibogaine at the International Harm Reduction Association, which pays for uh, methadone and needle exchanges in 80 countries. I mean, they do the methadone in China. They do Suboxone and methadone in Iran. Okay, that melted away. So the first time, I'm not dependent upon the medical marijuana movement to raise money. I can get it from George Soros. This is very important about me reoffending, Your Honor. I don't have to do that anymore. So anyway, you have to make a choice now. We've, uh, in an ideal world, OK, you let me go with time served. I've almost done a year in county jail. And you'd let me do my community service by sending people uh, from, say, Grant County to you know, people really addicted to heroin or crystal meth, to licensed government licensed clinics in Mexico. Now, I met a kid in the uh, jail here who was going to spend, his parents were going to spend $28,000 to put him in Hazelden for 28 days. We can do that same treatment in 10 days, and our treatment works. Hazelden doesn't work. You need at least 18 months in Hazelden. But I think you're probably a little bit wary about referring people to a treatment that's so cutting edge in any way as a Schedule One drug, which is actually why we're still trying to get it rescheduled. So we've asked for a year. And I would like to say that uh, number one, I really am concerned about extended supervision because I want to travel. I actually would think you would be more comfortable with me being in South Africa, working on Ibogaine for countries around the Indian Ocean than being in the United States because I, I can't be schlepping pot if I'm in South Africa. But at the same time, you know, if I'm on pro probation, I got to come back once a month to see the probation officer if they let me travel. So I, I ask that the uh, probation or parole not be too lengthy. The other thing is that I really do need that operation. I have two huge hernias at the bottom of my abdomen. And I'm, I'm not very confident in either the hospital here or the, uh, what I'll get in prison because uh, my, uh, they don't do hernias here. And my friend in London got that, that same operation, developed a blood clot, and had a stroke. And as I said before, my father and my grandfather both died of stroke at 65. I'm 64, OK? So it would be nice if I could get to a hospital that I can trust as soon as possible to get this operation and not wait three or four years. Um, on the night, on the night of like January, uh, last sentence, on the night of January 6th, the road to Ibogaine led through Madison. It doesn't lead through Madison anymore. It leads through Kathmandu and Dar es Salaam Phnom Penh, especially Kabul, where we've actually gotten the permits to uh, open a clinic, except that the guy who got the permits fell in love with a Finnish girl and fled an arranged marriage. So that, the permit is there. I can go there and open that clinic. 
if you don't want to, if you don't want to try it out here, please let us release the cure to addiction to the rest of the world. I don't have to do medical marijuana anymore. There's 10,000 people who want to do medical marijuana. I've already been replaced. People have already taken over what I was doing. There's plenty more. There's a hundred more people. I'm actually really important to the Ibogaine movement. They need me for that. Uh, they didn't even, they had no conference this year, and they had no conference in Europe either. So I'm fairly vital to that. And I'm willing to give up medical marijuana to pursue this one thing, which is legal in everywhere in the world except here, basically, and a couple small countries in Europe. It's legal in Africa, it's legal in South America, it's legal all over Asia. We're giving ibogaine treatments right now in Saudi Arabia. Please, let us release the cure for addiction to the rest of the world.